Hey guys, and welcome back to my channel, Jaden Reads. So, as you know, this week I have been trying to learn more about the Black Lives Matter movement, and I said that one of the books that I was going to read this week is this cute little book, Little Leaders, Bold Women in Black History. I got this book because obviously it's like so adorable, and also if you guys have been watching my channel for a while, then you probably know that I work at a school for kids with autism. And I will most likely be teaching there this upcoming fall. And I'm really excited, but I just wanted to try out my, I don't know, my like teaching abilities. <laughs> so I thought that in order to talk about this book, I could just read part of it and discuss part of it with you guys as if I were your teacher and you were my class because, I mean, it's a cute book for little kids and I don't necessarily know how to review it otherwise. So, sorry, I'm like moving around on my chair. You can hear it, but I'm just trying to get comfortable. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, I just wanted to read a little bit and learn a little bit together because that's what this entire reading thing, I don't even know what to call it, this like four- book reading challenge, whatever thing that I'm doing is, it's to learn together. So without further ado, <laughs> let's read together and learn together. So to start, um, this book has a cute little dedication and it says, to all the women whose stories are in this book, thank you for being leaders. Thank you for being brave. Thank you for being bold. We are grateful and we are inspired. To all the leaders yet to come, big or little, I cannot wait to hear your stories. So if I were teaching, you know, I would ask my students, what do you guys think that it means to be leaders or to be brave or to be bold? And what are some examples of how you've seen that in other people? And how do you think that you can be these things? How can you be a leader who is brave and bold? And what kind of things are you passionate about and what do you want to be a leader about in the future? You know, we would talk about that a little bit. Then, moving on, there's this cute little introduction where the author, who is Vashti Harrison, I think is how you say that, she writes about why she chose to write this book. Part of the introduction, an important part, says... In a society where being black and female meant being an outsider or sometimes invisible, these women dared to go after what they wanted, to demand what they deserved. So what do you guys think that means? Once again, if I were talking to a class, what do you think that means to be an outsider? And why, if you had dark skin, if you had black skin, and if you were a girl, why do you think that would make you more of an outsider than somebody else? Also, what would you need to go after what you wanted? If people kept telling you no, but you wanted something, would you need to be brave? And then moving on, some of them were reluctant leaders, while others were not even conscious of their bravery. But their legacies live on to pave the way for more of us to follow. So then we could talk about that and say, what do you guys think it means to be a reluctant leader? Because, you know, for someone who's just a little baby, that might be kind of hard to understand, but talk about what does that mean? What does that mean to be a leader, even if you don't necessarily want to be or you didn't even know that you were? Most of them didn't set out to be pioneers, but all of them were, and we can look to each of them for inspiration. And then another important part of this introduction that I wanted to read together, okay, was the author talking about herself growing up. And she said, this is in no way, oh, this in no way means that this book is only for black girls. I hope readers of every background find these stories compelling and inspiring, but I did create it with them and my younger self in mind. I think about what kind of dreams I might have had if I had known about all these women when I was growing up, if I had known that so many people who looked like me had done such incredible things. And so then I would ask my class, why do you think it's important to know that somebody like you, somebody who looks like you, somebody who has autism like you do, because my students would have autism, why is it important to know that somebody who has autism can do good things? Does it sometimes feel intimidating or scary? 
when you hear about people who have done good things, but you never hear that they had autism or that they looked like you or that you were like you? Is it helpful to know of people that did? And we could have that discussion. The book then says, to be able to see yourself and someone else's story can be life-changing. To know that a goal is achievable can be empowering. I hope that anyone who reads these biographies, whether or not they look like these little leaders, is inspired to go after the things they are passionate about. And I want to tell all of you that while it may be very hard, that you can go for the things that you are interested in, that you can be what you put your mind to. And while, you know, we do need to be realistic and address some barriers that exist, and I can't, you know, I can't guarantee that outcome for you, I want you to know, oh, sorry, there's a huge glare on my little glasses, but <laughs> I want you to know that I want you to try and that I believe in you and I believe that you can be anything. Just because you have autism doesn't mean that you can't do what you want to do. You can, and I believe in you, and I will support you, and I will be there right by your side. The same as it doesn't matter if you're a girl. If you're a girl, you can do it. If you have black skin, you can do it. If you're an immigrant, you can do it. You can do it, and I will support you. Moving on, if you can see, I have a lot of stickies, you can't even really tell, of stories that I really liked, but... Now I'm just going to talk about some of these females that I really liked with you guys. A lot of them are women that I'd never even heard of. So yeah, let's read about some together. <laughs> so this beautiful girl, her name is Phyllis Wheatley. And she was born in 1753 and died in 1784. Who can do that math for me? Who can tell me how old she was when she died? That's right, she was very young. Phyllis was a poet. Let's read some more about her. Phyllis's literary skills were apparent early on. She published her first story when she was only about 14 years old. For anyone, this would be a major feat, but Phyllis was a slave, so it was truly unique. And then I would ask my class, what do you guys think that means when it says that she's a slave? And then we could talk about slavery together. And then we could also talk about why that's so impressive that she was able to publish a story at 14. Why that would be impressive for anyone, and once again, why that would be impressive for a slave in particular. Her original name, date of birth, and exact birthplace are all unknown. When she was only eight years old, she was taken from her home in Africa and sold to a trader. A trader, not a traitor. <laughs> then transported across the Atlantic to Boston, Massachusetts, aboard a ship named the Phyllis. She was then resold to a man named John Wheatley, who purchased her to be a personal servant to his wife. And then we could go right back here and say, remember it said that her original name is unknown. What was the name of the ship she came on? Phyllis. And they called her that. They said that that was her first name. What do you guys think? If you guys were sold as a slave and you were on a board or and you were on a ship named Jaden, would you want people to call you Jaden? Would you feel like that's your real name or would that feel kind of yucky to you? So we could talk about that. The Wheatleys soon recognized her intelligence and began to nurture it. They taught Phyllis everything from theology to mythology, an education that was rare for a woman and nearly unheard of for a woman of color. Within, oh, with the family's backing, she traveled to England to publish her first book, poems on various subjects, religious and moral. She was the first African-American woman poet ever to be published. She corresponded with George Washington and the famous French writer and philosopher Voltaire, who called her a master of English verse. Her work was so powerful that abolitionists used it as an example of the intelligence and promise of black people. So then I would use that to kind of talk to my students and say, okay, why was it so important that Phyllis learned? Maybe she didn't get to go to school like you guys are at school, but she still had to learn the same things. What good did that do for her? What do they mean when they say that her work was so powerful that abolitionists, people who wanted to fight slavery, used it as an example of the intelligence and promise of black people? Why do you guys think that's important? And we could talk about that. In 1767, she was emancipated. Unfortunately, she struggled financially and lived in poverty for the rest of her life. She received a great deal of praise during her lifetime 
but validation from white society was integral to her success, and it never came. And we could talk about that. We could talk about why she needed white people to accept her work and why that's not really okay and it's not really fair and also why they think that never came when she was alive. She continued writing but was not able to find a publisher in America. We can also talk about that and how that's a form of discrimination, that people didn't want to publish her work because she was black and because she was a girl and how those things aren't okay. Her natural talent and body of work live on as fundamental contributions to American literature. So guys, that's Phyllis Wheatley. What do you think about her? And then they could share their thoughts. Okay, you guys, we're going to learn about somebody new, someone who's really cool. Raise your hand if you've ever wanted to be a spy. Oh, what do you guys think it means to be a spy? We could talk about that a little bit and then say, yeah, now today we're going to learn about someone named Mary Bowser. Who's ever heard of Mary Bowser before? Nobody? That's okay. I hadn't either before I read this book. But guess what, you guys? She was a spy in the Civil War. Who knows what the Civil War is? We'll get a little chat, chat, chat. Okay, let's read about her. Very little is recorded about Mary's life. What we do know is that she was born into slavery in Richmond, Virginia, around 1840. She was purchased by the wealthy Van Lu family as a companion for their daughter, Elizabeth. What does that mean when they say companion, you guys? Oh, as her friend. Good job. The Van Lu oh, the Van Lu's were no ordinary family in the South, though. They had a secret. They were northern spies and abolitionists involved in the secret underground railroad. What does that mean, you guys, abolitionists? Oh, it means people who don't believe in slavery, right? And what's the underground railroad? You're right, we talked about Harriet Tubman just the other day. Prior to the war, when Mary was a teen, Elizabeth granted her freedom and arranged for her to receive her education in Philadelphia. Mary wanted to assist the Van Loos in their efforts against the Confederacy. At that time in the South, it was illegal for a black person to have an education or even to read. Do you guys think that's fair? No. Nope. And that's what we call racism and discrimination, right? That that's not okay. That we can't tell people they can't learn to read. Yeah, that's not fair. For that reason, no one would ever suspect Mary was a threat. But this time it worked to her advantage, huh? Because people thought that she couldn't read, but she could, so she was tricking them. As a slave, she could hide in plain sight, so she agreed to go undercover as a slave in Jefferson Davis's Confederate White House. While cleaning, she would steal glances at confidential memos, and while serving dinner, she would eavesdrop on conversations between Confederate officials. She passed information about the troop movements and army plans to Elizabeth, who passed them along to Union officials. Rumor has it that Mary had a photographic memory and was able to read a page once and recite it back word for word. Wow, that's really cool, you guys. So when she was a slave, she was able to go and serve dinner to people and listen to what they were saying, and they all thought that she wasn't smart enough to understand them which is racism and discrimination and really mean and bad, right? But she was smart because she learned. And so guess what? She heard what they were saying and she was able to take those bad things they were saying and tell it to the people who didn't want there to be slavery anymore so that she could fight against them. Pretty cool, huh? After the war, Mary educated freed slaves and traveled around the United States giving speeches. For a long time, she was careful to conceal her true identity using a variety of aliases. That means she used different names. Eventually, she disappeared completely, but she is remembered. In 1995, she was inducted into the Military Intelligence Hall of Fame. Cool, huh, you guys? I have quite a few more little, like, sticky notes of women who were really cool that I want to talk about. I mean, obviously all of these people are. Um, I put in here, I put a little sticky for Ida B. Wells, for Alice Ball, Bessie Coleman. This was my other little sticky. Oh, Josephine Baker. 
a lot of really cool women that honestly I didn't know anything about before I read this book. And sorry, I know that was a bit of like a different way to explore the book, but I just wanted to show that obviously racism is something that's been going on for a long time. And even though it seems like a big topic, it's actually something that is really easy to teach to kids. And I think it's appropriate for kids to know about. They're smarter than we give them credit for, and they need to know what happened in the world because they're going to be part of the people who make the world a better place. And so it's not our place to keep information from them. And I think that by reading books like this and having real, true, honest discussions together, we can help them learn about racism in a way that doesn't feel overwhelming or scary to, you know, our little students. And so I would encourage all of you to have conversations with the little people in your life and to talk to them about racism and about discrimination and why it's not nice to treat people different just because of the way that they look or how they were born. You know, in fact, it's not really ever good to treat people unkindly. But all that aside, like I said, this may be a book that's written for kids, but it has a lot of really great information and taught me a lot about Black women that I didn't know. These Black women are really big inspirations to me because they're examples of people who persevered through hard times and fought for what they knew to be right, even when they were persecuted for it and people pushed back against them, which is what I think a lot of us are experiencing right now. Definitely not to this level of severity, but I think it's kind of relatable. Anyway, I just wanted to share a little bit about this cute, sweet book, Little Leaders, with you guys. I would totally suggest checking it out and learning more about the women written about in this book because we need more positive role models. Yeah, I hope that you enjoyed this video. I'll be back with more soon with my thoughts on the other books that I've been reading. I hope you guys are doing well in your pursuit of knowledge, and yeah, I'll talk to you guys in my next video. Bye!